Hi there, this is Ralph. I'm going to go through the uh, exercise one questions here. Uh, this exercise refers to an Excel file, that Excel file here, wage.xls, and that has a number of different variables. It has a uh, wage variable, an experience variable, education and tenure variable. So let us just briefly look at this. Uh, at this file, here we have that file, and here you can see the four, the four variables. Um, oops, that, I did not want to do that. So, and uh, let's just see how many observations we have here. We have 526 observations. So let me just go to the background. Now I want to create an eViews file with these data. Uh, I'm doing this here from home. I, I have a quite old EVS version. I hope that soon I will be able to access a newer EVS version. But uh, in general, things will be uh, will be similar. So we want a new file, a work file, uh, undated irregular. We have five two six data, and I always find the quickest one to go to the empty group. Um, option and now just copy the data from paste, copy and paste the data into eViews. There you go, paste here yeah, all the data. I just need to give the, I just need to give the variables names. So the first one shall be a wage. Let me uh, close this because in newer versions you can't do this in the spreadsheet anymore. You have to do it here. The second one shall be education. The third one is experience. And the uh, last one, the fourth, is tenure. Okay, so now the first task is to. Ah, okay. So, firstly, uh, you should be familiar with uh, eViews. You already had an eViews tutorial in uh, semester one, and I can just say, do it. Use eViews. Uh, if you don't, it's, uh, I don't know, it's your own problem, frankly. Uh, doing all the stuff here we do in this course in eViews is a great way to learn uh, the econometrics behind it better. So the next task is we want to import the data. We have done that. Tick. Uh, and complete the following table. What we see here are all sorts of summary statistics. Uh, a few are entered so we know we've done the right thing in eViews. The way to get summary statistics we'll just highlight all our four series, we open them as a group, and then in view we go to descriptive stats, and we don't have missing samples, so we can go to common sample or individual sample, won't make a difference, let me just um, move this a bit across, so here we now let's just ensure we have the right uh, data. In uh, the exercise question, wage, the average wage, the mean wage is 5.896, and we have exactly that one here, 5.896. Now I just highlight uh, the values, so I'm not going to write them down. So wage standard deviation would be this value, 3.693. Um, minimum is given here, or 0.53. Um, maximum is 24, but that was already given. Kurtosis is here, and the same for all sorts of other variables. So this was really only to remind you how to get summary statistics in eViews. So let's close that group and uh, put eViews in the background. The next question, uh, let me oops, uh, copy it in. So question three was run the following OLS regression. Uh, so we have wages are dependent, education, experience, and tenure as explanatory variables. Open as equation. 
I O. It always by default puts the constant as the last variable. For some strange reason, I really dislike that, so I put the constant as the first explanatory variable. Click OK and confirm that beta 1, the education coefficient, is 0.5999, and indeed it is 0.598965, so rounded to 0.599. So that means we uh, exercise 3 is a tick. You will obviously realize that all of this is really revision from semester one, but we need to make sure you are on uh, top of that. So question four to follow. Explain how to calculate the residual for the third observation in your file. Now, the, uh, for that we have to be clear of what the output which we were given here, and perhaps I should just copy that across. Here is the output. We'll just put it here, what this output means. So this output basically gives us the uh, regression equation. So we'll have uh, wage I hat, so the estimated wage equals beta naught hat plus beta 1 hat times education i plus beta 2 hat times experience i plus beta 3 hat times tenure i. Okay, so that is the results, the coefficients which we have here will basically give us the values for these beta hats. So we know, and we'll use these coefficients in a second, so uh, perhaps to, uh, to make it abundantly clear, we have this value here, it's going to be this. The, uh, this value here is going to be this value. This value third value is going to be the estimated coefficient to experience beta 2 hat and I need a fourth color uh, may not be nice but it's a color beta hat 3 is 0 0.169 so what we now want is we want to calculate the third residual so we have epsilon i hat what we want so what we have here is wage i. If you, if we go a little bit back up, if you look at this equation, our initial regression model, what we, what we get once we estimate these parameters, what we get is wage i equals wage i hat plus epsilon i hat. Okay, the wage i hat is going to be this part once we have estimated parameters and this guy here is going to be the estimated residual. So if we want to have now instead of i we set the third observation, so we set i to 3 so and we want this guy, so we want epsilon 3 hat. So what we need is we need to bring the wage hat across to the other side. So we'll get wage for the third observation minus wage 3 hat minus the estimated value. So to and for, for wage 3 hat we now just substitute all we have up here. But what we need to calculate that, we need the actual observations for uh, for the third observation. We need the wage, we need education, experience and tenure. For that we go back to to eViews and we delete the equation and I'll give it a name, we'll call it OLS1. Save 
it somewhere, so I'm not losing it. Of course, you always want to do that. Losing stuff is a heartbreak. Which, okay, so we need to go back to EVs. Oh, I must have deleted EVs, so let me, let me get it back. Here we go, hopefully, yeah, here we go. So we want wage, education, experience, tenure. So we open this again, we open it as a group. And here in this row, we have our observations. 3, 11, 12, and zero. Zero meaning uh, the employee just started with the company. So 3, 11, sorry, 3, 11, 2, and zero. So let me just write this down here. 3, 11, 2, and zero. So wage, 3 was 3. Education 3 was 11, so that employee had 11 years of experience. Ah, sorry, of education. Experience for the third observation is 2, so he's been in the workplace for 2 years. Uh, but tenure for the third observation is 0, so he only, that person only just started with the, with the company. So epsilon hat 3 equals wage 3, that's 3 minus and now this guy all this guy so minus beta not hat so minus minus 2.8727 so that is in fact plus 2.873 not just round to three now it's round to four numbers then minus beta one education so we have minus beta 1, that is 0 0.5990, if we round it times the education times 11, then minus beta 2 times experience, experience coefficient to experience is 0 0.0223 times the experience, that's 2, and then minus beta 3 hat, that's uh, 0 0.169 times tenure, but tenure is 0, so we can leave that guy away. So basically we just have to calculate this. Bring, let me bring up a calculator. So we have 3 plus 2.8737 minus, and let me open parenthesis, 0 0.5990 times 11, close parenthesis, minus 0 0.0223 times 2. So the result is negative, oh, I forgot it, negative 0.7599. Negative 0.7599. Nine, nine. So what does that mean? We have a negative residual. That means that the estimated wage is larger than the actual wage. Okay, so that's what the mean, what the meaning of a negative residual is. Next question is to interpret some summary statistics. Uh, so I'm sure we still have the regression output in the window. Okay, so five. So let's see which summary statistics you should be, uh, you should know at this stage. So let's use a green pen. The ones you should know are the R squared, the adjusted R squared, standard error of the regression, sum of squared residuals, um, mean dependent variable and standard deviation of dependent variable are exactly what they are, not really statistics of the regression, and f stats and the p value of the f stats. So that's what you should know. Let's give these uh, names one, two, three, four, and over here we have five and six. So one, the r squared is. 0.3064 that means 
just more than 30% of the variation in the dependent variable is explained by variation in the explanatory variable. So make sure you, you know this expression exactly. Okay, It's very important. We are talking about variation in the dependent variable being explained by variation in the explanatory variables. Two, the adjusted R squared um, is 0.3024. So that's very similar to the R squared. It's usually or it's somewhat smaller than the R squared. And this is adjusted for the number of explanatory variables. You know that whenever you add an additional variable, you will increase the R squared. So if you compare different models with different explanatory variables, you want to make sure that the fact that one model has a higher R squared than the other is not only due to the fact that the model just have, has more explanatory variables. That's what we calculate the adjusted R squared for. So and that is that value. So it's not exactly, the, the meaning is now not exactly that 30.24% uh, of the variation in the dependent variable is explained by variation in the explanatory variable. It is based on a measure that's interpreted like this, the R squared, but it's not exactly that. Three, standard error of the regression, often also called S. And what is S? S is 1 over n times the sum of the squared residuals. So our residual, estimated residuals were epsilon i hat, but we square them We'll sum them up and then we calculate something like an average of this. Unfortunately, well, however, we are not dividing by n, so it's not times 1 over n, but it's by 1 over n minus the number of estimated parameters. In our case, we're estimating four parameters constant, beta naught, beta 1, beta 2, and beta 3. So it's in this case n minus 4. And that value is. 3.0845. Uh, the fourth, so let me continue here so we can keep looking at the regression output. The fourth output is background. You can hear my uh, daughter, she's a little bit unhappy. So the fourth output is the F stat. Okay, and that is uh, the F stat is 76.8. 8731. Now this is a test statistic. You know when you calculate a test statistic, what we you really what's most crucial to the test is what is the null hypothesis and what's the alternative hypothesis. This is the test statistic to test the following null hypothesis. Beta 1 equal to beta 2 is equal to beta 3. That is the coefficients to all three explanatory variables. Okay, so we have three explanatory variables and all these coefficients being equal to zero. That means all the three explanatory variables are irrelevant to explain variation in age. And the alternative hypothesis is that any beta i is unequal to zero where i is either one two or three. Or in other words, any of these three coefficients is unequal to zero. That means at least one of the explanatory variables, but perhaps also two or three, are indeed relevant to explain variation in VH. So the F stat is a test statistic to test this hypothesis. Of course, to test the hypothesis, we need to know how the F stat is distributed under the null hypothesis. It's distributed with F as an F distribution with, in this case, and the F distribution has two different degrees of freedom. The first one is the number of restrictions. That's here three. We are restricting three coefficients. And the second degree of freedom is again n minus four. Okay, it is again the degrees of freedom of our model. It is basically, it's the same n minus four as we used here. And the decision rule is 
reject H0 if the calculated F stat is larger than the critical value. So it's a right tailed test. So to actually to actually test the um, no, actually, I I forgot this was actually five. Our statistic five. I'll get back to four. Okay. Uh, to to actually test this, we need to know the critical value, or we use the alternative way of deciding on a uh, on a test. So the alternative is we reject H naught if either this is the case or if the p value is smaller than alpha. Okay. Now I haven't set an alpha, so we can't um, can't uh, conclude that test. But this guy here, the p value, that is the statistic number six. Okay. So that value, let me use a different color. This value here is this value. Okay. Now that is extremely small. In fact, it's virtually zero. That means what alpha, whatever alpha we use, any reasonable alpha we use, we would reject this null hypothesis. Okay. So this will be rejected. This one seems to be uh, the appropriate description of the data. So let me get back to number four. The sum of squared residuals. So S S R, and that is equal to four nine six six point three zero three. Well, sum of squared residuals is exactly what it says. Okay. In fact, it is exactly this one. Okay. The sum of the squared estimated residuals. And sometimes we call that SSR. Next question is to interpret the estimated parameters. As you can see, it's uh, we're still in a revision stage here. Oh, in the revision stage, let me let me copy our regression results over again. So we'll have uh, we'll get to the constant last the first one education 0.598 about 0.6 that means ceteris paribus that means every other explanatory variable held constant an increase in the education variable by one unit that means here one year will deliver on average a wage increase of 0.6 dollars about 0.6 dollars. Let's move on to the experience one. Again, ceteris paribus, assuming education and tenure stay constant, an increase in the experience variable by one unit, that means one extra year of experience, will deliver an increase in wages of 0 0.02 dollars. So that's two cents. And third, ceteris paribus, meaning education experience stay constant, an increase in tenure by one unit, by one year, will on average increase wages by about $0.17. So, in that sense, can we interpret the constant? Constant is negative 0.28. Mechanistically speaking, it means that if education experience and tenure take values of zero, we would expect a wage of negative 2.87. Now that doesn't make sense because there won't be any employees with zero education, zero experience and zero tenure. So the constant you really can only interpret if putting a zero value to all explanatory variables actually has a meaning. Okay, Here it doesn't have a meaning so we really shouldn't interpret the constant. Question 7 asks us to interpret the residuals you calculate we calculated above in question four we've already done that okay we um, interpreted that negative value we said that we expect or we predicted a larger wage than the actual wage of the third 
um, employee. So we are now in question eight. We are asked to let me continue here. Perform a hypothesis test. Now this is bread and butter stuff, but you really need to have a black belt uh, in this sort of stuff. So let's start with an obvious one. Beta two null hypothesis beta two equal to zero h a unequal to zero. So we have a two-tailed test. Beta two that's this coefficient here. Okay. So, what's the decision rule? Okay, decision rule, and you should always write that down. And also, hang on, we need the test stat. Let's write down the test stat first. It's a t-test, and it's going to be beta hat to minus beta two divided by the standard error of beta hat two. Let's just calculate this. We can calculate that before we do the decision rule, but we have to wait with our judgment. Beta 2 hat, that is this value. So we have 0.0223 divided by the standard error, that is this guy here, 0.012, 0 0.0121, okay. That is our uh, standard error, and uh, the uh, value here is 1.8528 when we calculate this. So now, importantly, before we know what that means, we have to write down the decision rule. Reject H0 if and now there are two, two ways to do that. If the t stat, and since we have a two-sided test, we will use the absolute t stat is larger than the critical value. So the question is now, where does the critical value come from? We know that the t test, the t stat, under the null hypothesis is t distributed with n minus k minus 1 decrease of freedom where the k minus 1 or the minus k minus 1 is subtracting the number of estimated parameters that's 4 here so it's going to be n minus 4 decrease of freedom so we basically now need to find this critical value for this uh, I uploaded here a file with statistical tables let me just find the um, appropriate t table mm, percentage points for the t distribution we have how many degrees of freedom have we got we have 526 observations minus 4 that's 522 observations so in this table here uh, we have the degrees of freedom uh, here and so we have to go to 526 well that's the infinity column and then we have to find out what is uh, the, uh, the tail probability. We are being asked to calculate a test at a 5% significance level. So before we get this, let me just sketch a little distribution. Okay, T distributions look very much like normal. In fact, with these numbers of degrees of freedom, it's going to be like the normal. And if you have a two-sided test, we want to find the critical value, and it's a negative and a positive, which on each end cuts off an area of alpha over 2. Alpha over 2. So that means if alpha is 5%, what we now need in this table so what this table however gives, you can see it's the probability that the t-statistic is smaller than a certain critical value. So what we get in this table is a probability of, for instance, this type. Okay. So what we need, this blue area, if the red area here is supposed to be 0.025, that is 5% over a half, because we have a two-tailed test, 
then the blue area got to be how much? The blue area got to be 0 0.975 because we know these two have to add up to 1. So in this table we will now have to look for 0 0.975, that's here, that is this this column, so it's a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5th column, go to the bottom, 5th column in the last row, 1.96, that of course we know from the normal distribution. Okay, because with that many degrees of freedom, the t distribution is equal to the normal distribution. So now we are in a position to make a decision. Our t test, 1.85, the absolute value is still 1.85, is not larger than the critical value. Therefore, we do not reject H0. So let's look at the uh, second hypothesis, B. Now we have a one-sided hypothesis. So we've got to be careful here. Firstly, the t-test will be exactly the same. Okay, so, uh, okay, I'm referring now to beta 1, that is the education parameter. The t-test is going to be beta 1 hat minus beta 1 that comes from the null hypothesis divided by standard error of beta 1 hat. So beta 1 hat is 0 0.5990 minus beta 1, that's from the null hypothesis, that's 0 0.5, divided by the standard error, that is this guy here, 0 0.0513. So if we do this calculation, we will get a value of 1.9298. 9298. So now the decision rule. Reject H0 if the t-test is what in relation to the critical value. Now, we have a right-tailed test, okay? We want to reject the null hypothesis if beta 1 is clearly larger than 0 0.5. That means in our decision rule, it will say t larger than the critical value. Since we have a one-sided test, we will not use the absolute sign, okay? We, we must not use the absolute sign. So we reject H0 if the t test is larger than the critical value. Now. Where does the critical value come from? We'll make a little drawing again. Here's our distribution. Not very, very nice, but this one. So what we now want, we want again to do that at 5%. Since we have a one side test, a right tail test, we now want to find the value that cuts off alpha or 5% in here. That means what's the blue area here? That ought to be 0 0.95. And that's the value we can find in this table. We look at the t distribution again. We know it's practically the same as the normal distribution. Alpha 0 0.95 and uh, infinite numbers of degrees of freedom is 1.645. So that value here is going to be 1.645. That is the critical value. 1.645. Now we can compare our t-test to that one. The t-test is indeed larger than the critical value, therefore we reject H0. Okay. Next hypothesis to be tested is should appear here, yeah, okay. Question C is the following three coefficients equal to zero. Oh uh, I can see there's a dot rather than an equal in here. This guy should be an equal. Now we already talked about this. If we go back up when we talked about uh, the statistics given in here, our statistic 5, the F statistic, 
with exactly the statistic we needed to test this hypothesis that all the three coefficients beta 1, beta 2 and beta 3 are equal to zero. So in a way well, we've done all the calculations already for the test all we need to do now and we said here we checked H0 if f is larger than the critical values and our f stat was 76.87 so all we need now is the critical value so we need so we say reject H0 if f is larger than the critical value we also said that this critical value will come from the f distribution with three restrictions, so three degrees of freedom and n minus four. n minus four is 522 again. Let me find an f table here. There should be one not too far away. And at what significance level do we do this 5% again? So here we go, that's the 5% f distribution table. V1 is 3, 3 degrees of freedom here, and then the second decrease of freedom is down here, 150, that's the maximum. Okay, so we use that, that is the closest to what we have. We have to look at the third column, so it's 2.66, that's the critical value. So the critical value is 2.66. Now our test statistic was 76.87. So S76.87 is larger than 2.66, we reject H0. H0 said that none of the explanatory variables was relevant, but that hypothesis is clearly rejected. All right, the next hypothesis to be tested, I'll just scroll down a little, is this one. Now this is very similar to actually a semester one exam question. Okay, um, the, so the hypothesis here is that two coefficients in our model are similar. So to, to start this discussion off it is possibly best to just copy our regression uh, model or let me copy it from somewhere without scribbles. Here we go. So this was our original regression model. Now the hypothesis, null hypothesis tells us that these two coefficients are the same. So what we can do is we can, to find out how we test this, oh, before we do that, let's think about the test statistic first. This is only one restriction, but can we test it with a t-test? Well, as such, we can't, we can't really test it. There is a way to test it with a t-test, but let's use an f-test here. The f-test, for the f-test we have in the null hypothesis some restrictions. And the alternative is that the restrictions are not valid. The restrictions are not valid. So what we do is we estimate two models. We estimate a restricted model if the null hypothesis is true. A restricted model and we estimate an unrestricted model. Now the unrestricted model is just this guy and once we estimated it we will need from it the residual sum of squares and I'll put a little u to it for unrestricted. So the question is now, what is the unrestricted model? How do we get that? We get that, sorry, what is the restricted model? Well, we basically we implement 
the null hypothesis, the restriction. So we've got to be clear about what that is. Let me just copy it again. Beta 2 is equal to beta 3. So what we do is we'll basically replace the beta 2 here with a beta and the beta 3 with a beta 2 because the null hypothesis tells us they should be the same. Then we can simplify the model somewhat. We can say beta naught plus beta 1 times education plus, and now we have two terms with beta 2, so we factor out the beta 2 plus beta 2 times experience plus tenure and plus an error term. So this is basically now going to be the restricted model. So how do we regress this? Use a different color. We basically have a, a model where we have wage as the dependent variable. We have a constant. We have education as an explanatory variable. And we have experience plus tenure as an uh, explanatory variable. And we have some some residuals. Now I left these little gaps because the parameters we shouldn't use beta really anymore because this the model in the restricted model and the unrestricted model are not going to be the same so I don't really want to use beta naught here and beta 1 because they are not necessarily the same so I just use a different name. I use gammas okay gamma naught, gamma 1, gamma 2 plus residuals, they're not the same residuals as the, these necessarily either, so I use different names for residuals. So this is the restricted model, and from here we want the residual sum of squares as well, and we label them the restricted residual sum of squares. And then, as we are looking after an f-test, we need to calculate the f-test, and that is always calculated the same way. Residual sum squared restricted minus residual sum squared unrestricted divided by residual sum of squares unrestricted. And then the denominator is divided by the number of restrictions here. We really only have one restriction, so divided by one, divided by, and here we always have, so here we always have the number of restrictions and here we always have the decrease of freedom of the unrestricted model. What are they? They are n minus how many coefficients do we estimate in the unrestricted model? 1, 2, 3, 4. So n minus 4. So this is our residual sum of squares, uh, our f-test, and then we um, reject h0 if f is, and now oh, let's lose it, use a little graph again, the f-test, the, resi the restricted residual sum of squares, these guys here are always larger than the unrestricted. Okay, the restricted model will fit worse than the unrestricted model and therefore the residual sum of squares are going to be larger. That means this test statistic is always going to be positive. And the F distribution therefore only has values on the positive line. The distribution looks something like this. And we are after the critical value that in our case um, I didn't provide a, an alpha, right? So we just use, let's say, 1%. Let's say we use alpha equals 0 0.01, just for a change. That means we want the critical value that cuts off 1% here, and that leaves 0 0.99 here. So we reject H0 if F is larger than the critical value. Let's find the critical value from the statistical table f 5% uh, f 1% 1, 1 restriction uh, n minus 4 is 5 to 2 so lots of decrease of freedom 
6.81 is our critical value. So our critical value is 6.81. In fact, if you look, I just looked at Woolridge, I don't have that as PDF files, uh, you find as a critical value 6.63, that is in the row with infinity, okay? That was with 150 degrees of freedom, that's with infinity, depending on which table you have available, uh, either will do. So now we just need to calculate the F. Let's think about what do we have? We have that value. That's Put little ticks to it. Okay, so we know how many restrictions we have. We have the n, so we know that is 5 to 6 minus 4. The unrestricted RSSU, that come, that's the RSS from this regression. Well, if you go back, we know this to be here, the sum of squared residuals, that is 4966303. So let's just write this down here that is 4966.303 so we have this value as well and that appears here as well the only thing we need is now this restricted residual sum of squares and to get that we need to estimate this regression with wages dependent variable constant education and experience plus tenure as explanatory variable so let us go to eviews we um, want to estimate a new model, wage, education, experience, tenure, all of these are involved in an equation, let's put the constant in front, but now we don't have experience and tenure independently, but we have the sum of the two as an explanatory variable, so I press OK, you can see what we get as regression output, we now only estimate three coefficients and the residual sum of squares is 5200. So it is clearly larger. So we need the restricted, so that guy here was 5200.177. Uh, Let me just write it here fully, F equals 52177 minus the unrestricted one, that is 4966.303 divided by 1, number of restrictions, divided by 4966.303 divided by 522, that's 526 minus 4. The result here is 24. 0.58. Now we compare that to the critical value and therefore we conclude that we can reject H0. That means that restriction, what was the restriction, that beta 2 and beta 3 are equal, that's equivalent to saying that experience and tenure have the same impact, okay? an additional year of experience would have the same as an additional year of tenure that's um, uh, that hypothesis is rejected. So for part nine of the question, I'll, I think I'll actually need a new sheet. So here is part nine. Uh, give me a more space. Okay. So consider the following regression model. We don't have a constant, just x1, x2, although 
It could of course be that the special case of x1 is a constant. Established under which condition beta 1, beta 2 from an old S regression are uncorrelated. That means covariance beta 1 hat and beta 2 hat is equal to 0. So the most important thing to understand here is what, what entity we are looking at. We are basically we are looking he, here at the variance of beta hat. Now what's beta hat? Beta is going to be, we are estimating two coefficients, so it's convenient to collect them in one vector, beta 1, beta 2. And you know from semester 1 that the variance of beta hat is sigma squared times x prime x inverse. Now if beta contains two elements, this guy here is going to be a 2 by 2 matrix. Where on the diagonal we will have the variance for beta 1 hat and the variance for beta 2 hat. Now I'll, I'll just do this bigger as I need to do this in so little space. So this is going to be a 2 by 2 matrix. Okay, 2 by 2. Over here, where here we have the variance of beta 1 hat. Here we have the variance of beta 2 hat. And here we have the covariance of beta 1 hat with beta 2 hat. And here the same, it's symmetric. So what this question basically now asks is, See this, under which condition is this guy going to be zero? Okay, the question is when is this zero? So we need to, to see what's hidden behind here and then, and because that will tell us what's in the, on this off diagonal element. So uh, to do that, we'll possibly have to introduce a matrix X. So we have to understand what that matrix X is. That is just a, an n by 2 vector which has our two variables x11, x12, all the way to x1n and x21, x22, all the way to x2n. So this is going to be an n by 2 vector. So this guy here is a scalar and we know this is going to be estimated with s squared hat. This is not going to be crucial for the argument. What's going to be important is mainly uh, this guy here, x prime x inverse. So firstly uh, we will need to establish what x prime x is. Now with uh, an argument, a similar argument uh, I've done in calculations in the lecture or I've uh, elaborated on them in in a uh, in another online video, so I'm going to be short here. In the top element, we're going to find x1, the sum of all x1 i squares. In the bottom element of uh, sorry, x prime x. What's x prime x? That's going to be two by two. And in the uh, bottom right element, it's going to be x2i squared and the sum of that. And then here we're going to have the sum of x1i times x2i. And here we're going to have exactly the same x1i, x2i. Okay, that's when we use this definition of the matrix x and we'll do this calculation. So we know that to calculate x from x inverse, that is basically going to be 1 over d times a matrix that's related to this x from x, but with some changes. And the changes are that the elements on the diagonal are interchanged. So we have x. 2i here, the sum of 
x2i squared, the sum of x1i squared here, and the elements on the off diagonal become, um, are pre multiplied with a minus 1. So the sum of x1i times x2i, and here negative sum of x1i, x2i. So to actually calculate the determinant, we need to know what the determinant is. You know how to calculate that, but again, to this argument, this is not crucial because that is going to be a scalar and a constant for all elements. So that means that the variance of beta hat is going to be sigma squared divided by the determinant times this matrix which we just wrote out 2i squared negative sum of x1i times x2i sum of x1i squared and here again the negative of x1i times x2i. So now our bottom, our red element here is going to be this guy here pre-multiplied with sigma squared times d. Now for this element to be zero, this is equal to zero if negative the sum of x1i x2i is equal to zero. Okay, so that's the, the error of the um, the variance of the error terms is going to be larger than zero. Um, is going to be larger than zero, and d is going to be larger than zero as well uh, if we have a full rank uh, matrix. So that means this is the condition. Okay, this is all what this question asked. The uh, prediction part of the video uh, exercise one is going to be in a separate video.